decrease intracranial pressure in the lungs, please. Thank you. Um, buongiorno. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to touch all good therapies, because therapies are double-edged anyway. So let me start with a disclaimer. I have no conflict of interest, but I have a second disclaimer to make, because what I'm going to present is going to be based on the literature, of course, and on my personal experience. And I will also provide you data that come from a common database I had with Giuseppe Citerio and uh, Luigi Barretta in Milano. So, more or less, I, I am going to say you what I do, what we do, what we did. So, I can be wrong and take all the messages as, let's say, as a way to simulate your thinking and it's not a gospel, it's something that we have experienced on and I stop here. So, that is the idea of escalating therapies. And you see here, what we have tried to present is that you can start with some very basic intervention, like keeping the patient stable, and then you can escalate and going up and up, up, up to extreme therapies. I think that uh, this pointer is agonizing, but that's interesting. Okay, um, on the other side here, um, the, the battery will be better to be changed for the next speaker. On this side, you see that for every intervention, the patient pays a price. You increase sedation, you may cause hypotension. You put a ventricular catheter, the risk is infectious. So, uh, for every intervention, we have to be aware, we may, the patient may pay the price. Uh, that seems new, it is not. Uh, that is the same escalating approach as it was used 30 years ago in Richmond, Virginia. And the purpose was for the nurses. So the, the idea was the nurses wanted to have a clear understanding of what was necessary to do to treat ICP. ICP exceeding the threshold, start doing something. If ICP goes up anyway, you increase and you do more. So that is the protocol. Is this idea of escalating therapies a smart idea? As doctors, I think that we should be a little bit skeptical. Because uh, if we use bluntly, or let's say blandly therapies, uh, we are risking something that is, it could be really not proper for the patient. Because uh, targeted therapies uh, would pro probably uh, represent the best approach. I identify a problem, I identify a possible solution, I will use it. So, in, uh, under this scenario, let me, thank you, let me say that we may have targets. Uh, I know that the brain is suffering because more water is accumulating into the brain. I know that we have a problem because uh, there is hydrocephalus, anyway, there is too much CSF, or we have vasodilation, or we have an increased cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen. If those targets could be identified, would it be reasonable to treat them? If I have an hydrocephalus, uh, what is the reason for giving mannitol or for using hyperventilation and not to withdraw CSF? I think that it's quite obvious. So the targeted approach uh, would represent a major step forward, but, but we have a problem. Then, because if you think of ICP here as the result of increased volumes inside the skull. The only targeted approach that is clearly available is surgery. I have an hematoma, I ask my surgeon to remove it. Simple as it is, that is targeted. But if I have swelling, how can I clearly separate swelling from edema? I think we should, but it's not that clear. And then, what is the most appropriate treatment? So my conclusion is, Targets are tricky to be identified, and very often there are multiple mechanisms interacting, so selective agents are not available. Let's think ahead. Targeted would be a major step forward. So my uh, pragmatic approach is first do surgery, no hesitation on it, that's targeted. Then try to correct what can be corrected and you have already listened to possible ideas, I will conceptualize it a bit on correctable causes afterward, but what we do usually is that we 
followed with a standard approach, which includes moderate hypocapnia, manifold, CSF withdrawal and sedation. Then, if that is not enough, we increase the intensity of therapy, and only in selected cases, we escalate to maximum therapy that we call extreme therapies. So you have already a hint on the way we think about being extreme. When? When to do that? Um, okay, surgery, as soon as possible. These are all data that I don't think are really credible. That is for epidur epidural hematoma. These are for subdural hematoma. And what they say is a complex, there are complex bars, but they say, if you wait too much, delayed surgery is worse than early surgery. Yesterday there was an Australian colleague providing data from military medicine. So I think that it could be reasonable to say, why should we have a brain suffering for a long time of compression, ischemia, or toxic effects of subdural? So it makes sense to do that as soon as possible. Very simple. What about uh, correctable? You have already heard from Jacques. Uh, uh, fever is bad. Uh, fever is bad when we think of increasing the metabolic rate of oxygen and increasing ICP. So if I have a patient who has intracranial hypertension and fever, why not to normalize the temperature and bring temperature and ICP back to normal? That's, I think, it may fit. Um, there are other possible correctable causes. Look at the right, hyponatremia is a very, very uh, stupid, uh, but it can be a very, very dangerous uh, threat for uh, our patients. Uh, these are the data from the three centers that cooperated uh, on this uh, common database, and we have been very obsessive in checking for natremia. So we, I think that these results are good. So we are looking at something like 500 patients. And you see that looking at sodium concentration, plasma concentration less than 135, uh, these are the first seven days, uh, is in the range of 2 8%. The message here, we were three centers. So one center was on the average, one center was on 8%, the other on 2. Meaning, you can be obsessive, obsessive but you can be even a little bit more obsessive. And if we like to avoid hyponatremia, you better check it. That is for correctable causes. So I think that the idea, we better check it carefully and uh, possibly prevent it. What about the standard treatment? Standard treatment means something that we can provide relatively easy. Um, I alluded already at these four components, but I would like also to indicate a very simple study coming from Cambridge, uh, regarding CSF withdrawal. The Cambridge study is this one, published in a supplement to, to ACTA, and they were looking for uh, using ventriculostomy, when you have it, to treat ICP. And the paper is really very, very simple, at the risk of being simplistic. It says that there are patients who respond and patients who do not. So it's easy. But in a little, very limited sample of patients, what we see here is that sometimes if you have a volume that you can manage before resorting to other therapies, if you have a ventric, withdraw the CSF. It makes sense. You reduce the volume. Therefore, therapies should be used when we have a problem, when ICP is a, a, an issue. So let's... Uh, uh, go from the standard to the reinforced, which is simply more of this, and let's talk a little bit about extreme therapies. And let me touch barbiturates, because they have been used as, the, let's say, the second group in other uh, trials, like the decompression trials. So it, they represent the tip of the iceberg of possible medical therapies. Barbiturates uh, are a poison. They can be a lethal poison, but but at the beginning, there was some enthusiasm in using barbiturates. I think the, the, the title is typically American, uh, no offense for you, Jonathan, but uh, they didn't just use barbiturates. They used barbiturates prophylactically. So it's like to say, I have something that is a poison and can be lethal, but I'd like to use it very early, possibly before the problem will start. <laughs> and the trial was, of course, a trial with the taste of uh, three decades uh, four decades ago, 
so a little number, 53 patients. What they did, there was something like a favorable outcome, slightly better. So I think it's inconclusive, but the message was clear. Because if you look at hypotension, more than half of the patients treated with barbiturates prophylactically suffered hypotension. And we can discuss if 41 is really significantly different from 38, but no doubt, hypotension is deleterious. And this is clear. If you look at this paper in Acta Anesthesiologica Scandinavica, this is a list of the possible complications. What I am saying is, barbiturates are a poison because they are very powerful. I am not discarding them, but I am inviting all of you to use them with caution because they can be extremely <coughs> dangerous. So what about a possible con con conclusion. I think that prophylactic strategies are not justified or rarely to be diplomatic. And if we have to select, we have to select therapies for raised ICP. How? Okay, the issue is uh, that it depends on you. It depends on the policies that you follow on in your center. Here I am uh, giving you, they have been published in three different papers, the person data of what we have done, what I did in Parma, then in my institution, and here in the common database. And uh, please look, um, what is the rate of surgical indications? Half of patients require surgery. That is because we act as a referring center. Uh, if you look at TBI in general, you may expect that one patient in five do require, does require surgery. Here, one and two, because uh, centers are referring patients for being operated on. But that is the first priority. Be careful. One patient in two may require surgery, so we better do that uh, very early. What about correctable causes? The stupid things, fever, hyponatremia, possible seizures, pain, uh, sedation inadequate, etc. It may range from 23 to 70% and it could become 70%. Meaning that if you are a good ICU, it's because your nurses are good, and they call you and you identify correctable problems on time. What about extreme therapies? This, I think, is the last message I, I would like to share with you. We use that sparingly. And sparingly means one patient on 10, or something like, or one patient on nine. On nine. Uh, I, I am very concerned when I feel that there is too much enthusiasm for being aggressive, putting a lot of probes, and then start treating and treating and treating. It looks like the, the extreme problems are not so common. And uh, of course, I felt the duty and the necessity of showing what the results were, because you could look at, the, the, at this data and say, okay, in Milano and Monza, they don't use the compression and barbiturates so often, so they, or the patient died. Uh, so I think it's necessary to look here, it's very simple, but look, favorable, 53%. Of course, if ICP was not a problem, 70% favorable. If ICP was not treatable, 11%. So ICP is a marker of severity very important, and we are not able to manage it perfectly. <coughs> But these are good results. So in conclusion, I think that this is the way we uh, respond to the questions. How and when is personal, is based on experience, is questionable. So I am open to your question. But it could help your reflection on your actual policies. Thank you.